Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may, be tramp they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your sons ask for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything you do, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Here in town... We have a Walmart. And some of you who have been here for a while remember what it was like when we got that Walmart. I mean, you would have thought World War III was going to break out because we were getting a Walmart in town. I remember coming to visit, and it was quite the controversy. I was like, what do you mean? Sam Walton, our Church of Christ brother, wants to open up a Walmart here? We had plenty of Walmarts in Colorado Springs. Why not open one up here? But people were furious. I don't know how it didn't get appealed to the Supreme Court. They were that angry, okay? But now people come from all over to come to our local Walmart, BV and the countrysides around us, because Walmart gives us cheap access to groceries and endless opportunities to judge people, right? <laughs> Maybe you've heard of the website called People of Walmart, okay? People send in their submissions of what people really wrote war to Walmart, and then they send it for the whole world to see. And the hardest part of this sermon was trying to find appropriate pictures to put on this slide. <laughs> because there were some wild ones, okay? And I must confess, I have laughed a time or two looking at these pictures. Because you see, it's really easy to judge people, to make judgments about them and uh, how we perceive these people to be. However, what would life be like if we didn't have to make these judgments? Today we explore a different way that Jesus offers because we find ourselves now in chapter 7 on the greatest sermon of all time, the last chapter in the Sermon on the Mount, and we are going to see what judgment causes. But judgment is not the issue here. Judgment is the symptom of a bigger issue. See, the heart of the problem is generosity. When we say we're generous, when we say someone is generous, generally we think about it as money. They are generous with their money. This or that person gives their things, shares their things, or gives away things. But I submit to you this morning that there is a form of generosity that is actually probably harder for us to give to the world around us. And that's what I want us to get into. But before that, let's pray. God, we come before you again hearing these words of Jesus. We get another glimpse of what your kingdom looks like through his words. So today I pray that your spirit would give us eyes to see how you view us. That your spirit would give us a clear vision of how to see ourselves. And that it would give us a clarity of how we should view others. Pour through me the gift of preaching that Christ may be formed in hearts. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Now let's break these words of Jesus down. First, let's start with do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be used to you. Okay, I think it's necessary to define judgment to start off with because often Judgment 
uh, is we, we use it as a synonym for an observation. Okay, an observation is not a judgment. Think of a judge. A judge observes a trial, and based on their observations, they make a judgment. The judgment is when your observation takes action against someone because of the observation you made about it. So think about what this looks like, to ju- how this works, and what it looks like to judge someone. You don't have to say anything to judge someone. You can make an observation on that, and based on your observation of that person, you can judge them. You can classify them in a certain social status, good or bad. You can perceive that they have value or do not have value based on their judgment. We judge someone in our minds and we place them into different categories. But going further, we can share our judgment to someone else, to a friend, a spouse, and declare our judgment and then say to the other that they should have this same judgment about another person. This is what the unfortunate part of middle school and high school is, right? Unfortunate judgments being made against us. People's social statuses, both in middle school and beyond, are based off of judgments made. A favorable judgment, we might want to hang around that person. We might want to associate with them. We might see value in them. A poor judgment leaves one isolated. So, how does this work at church? Well, first off, the easiest way to be judgmental is in in the areas of life where we have our act together. Where we particularly have to seem to have some strengths that we seem to do well. We can hold everyone's weaknesses against our strengths and they don't tend to measure up to them so we can judge them for that. But have you ever noticed the areas where others might be superior, we tend to change the subject. We tend to focus on something else. We tend to move on. We don't like to admit this, but it happens all the, uh, all the time. The other way we can treat people and judge people is, is how we're treating them. We might greet a visitor w- that we think has something in common with us, or we can uh, fellowship with someone we have a favorable judgment of. But going deeper, we might uh, work in spoken or unspoken ways to ostracize, to leave alone, to isolate the ones we feel like don't belong. One quick example that always comes to my mind when I think of this is from uh, Aubrey's Cousins Church in Oklahoma, a church of Christ down there where he serves as the youth minister. The church said that they desired to have teenagers to come to faith and be part of their church body, but their actions were something very different. See, he was doing his job, Aubrey's cousin. He was inviting these students in, and he brought in one troubled teen. Troubled teen had some trauma in his past, had a rough home life, didn't have a lot. He only really had a pair of clothes that he felt comfortable in and his favorite baseball cap. He was shy and insecure, so a baseball cap would be nice because it was a way to shield his eyes, a way to hide from society around him. The issue was, is the baseball cap in church didn't fit the unspoken dress code of the church. So there was a grumpy lady in church who thought she had the courage to say what no one else would. She went to the elders and she said, someone needs to tell that young boy to take off his baseball cap. The elders proceeded to explain to her everything I just laid out for you. And she wasn't having it. She wasn't liking it. So the elders said, okay, we have two choices here. We can tell him to take off his baseball cap and he's never going to come to church again. Or we can let him come to church with his baseball cap for a while. What would you like? And she said, easy choice. Tell him not to come to church. You wonder why that church struggles to have young people in the church. These are how our judgments work when they manifest in the world, when they manifest in our churches, these are the implications. But there is something far more dangerous here. Jesus tells us of a double judgment. Because the same way we judge other people, they're going to judge us back the exact same way. And that is a harsh, 
way to be judged. Barna Group has been tracking for 30 years. It hasn't changed. When non-Christians think of Christians, they think of us as judgmental and hypocritical. And we might say the same thing of them. And we're just pointing fingers back and forth, right? The cycle never ends of judging one another. But there's a scarier part, not the human judgment. If you've been reading along in your daily Bible reading, Jim pointed this out in class this morning. God's judgment. I think here there's a, there's, there's a sense that, oh, you're going to judge other people that way? Well, God says, okay, that's the standard we're rolling with. I'll judge you by that standard. Now, I don't know about you, but I want God grading on a curve with me, okay? I want it to work a little bit better than that. And luckily, Jesus gives us a solution. So we have enough home builders and woodworkers and lumberyard people in this congregation to know something about sawdust, right? Pesky sawdust. It will get up and it will get in your eye and you have to go trust a, talk to a trusted friend or a spouse and you say, hey, there is sawdust in your eye and you're holding your eye open and they're shining a light in it and you're looking around and they're trying to uh, catch the piece of sawdust in there. And Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is meant to be humorous, okay? The people in the crowd would have laughed at this point in the sermon. It's okay to laugh during sermons. I just want to point this out theologically here. Just laugh at the correct times. That's all I ask of you. Okay? Laugh at the correct times. So the person helping locate the speck of dust in their eye has a giant plank sticking out of their own eye. And they're helping locate the speck of dust. I mean, it's a fun, funny mental image if you think of it. However... This is often how judgmentalism works, right? Someone with a critical spirit condemns others and everyone else is using the same measure against them. Yet we all know this in life. Those who are the most critical in life tend to have the biggest blind spots. They're blind to their own faults. See, the hardest person to truly see in the world is ourself. It's hard to see ourselves Clearly, it took me seeing myself on the sermon recordings to realize my hair's thinning, right? <laughs> things happen. So how do we surgically remove the stick from our eyes? Well, the first step is gaining a new reflex when we're tempted to judge others. It takes time to develop this habit, but consider this. Whenever you are tempted to judge someone that you find guilty, instead of judging them, ask the question, am I guilty of this? Spend some time reflecting, looking in the mirror, searching for this plank in your own eye. You guys have all met our friends, uh, Tim and Katie Byrne. Tim's led singing some. Katie is the best I have ever met in my entire life. This, If a negative trait of anyone ever comes up, she goes, oh, you know what, I probably have that too. Do I have that? Do I need to work on it? And you're sitting there the whole time and she immediately has this reflex to say, okay, I'm going to look inwardly before I look outwardly. And so this is a really hard exercise. I get that. It's, it's hard uh, to do this. It's much easier to judge people. But whoever thought eye surgery wouldn't be painful. Right? If we're going to see the world a different way, the way that God sees it, it's going to take work. So try this practice. Now, on to the most bizarre words in this passage. Jesus says, Do not give to dogs what is sacred, and do not throw your pearls to pigs. Like, what? Jesus, what are you talking about here? I actually think this is the transition. This is the link between what Jesus said about judgment and what he's about to say about asking and seeking and knocking. See, calling people dogs and pigs, it's still an insult today. Go try it at Walmart. See what happens, right? It's probably not going to work well for you. And it was an insult in Jesus' day as, as well. It was a way to uh, name call the others or the outsiders of Jesus' day because a poor beggar would be acting like a dog, right? Or if you've been keeping up in your daily Bible reading, you learned this week all the unclean things about pigs. And so... 
to call a Roman occupier a pig would be a fitting thing. It would be really easy. It would be really honest. Like, like at this point we would have been, but Jesus, it was a funny joke. Can we not call, you know, can we call police officers that sometimes, right? And that's not very appropriate. And Jesus is saying, no, don't do this. You might make all these judgments and put downs, but here's the deal. A police officer, a Roman soldier, they have power over you. The irony is that years later after this, the Roman soldiers did come in and crush them for it. So instead, God's got a better idea. It's all about seeking and asking and finding. So what is this pattern of asking, seeking, and finding? See, I think this is where we get the image that God's a genie in a bottle with unlimited wishes. Like, okay, God, I'm asking for this, I'm seeking for this, and it's maybe whatever we want, a really good parking spot up front at Walmart or something, right? And God provided this for me. No, no, no. That is a major misunderstanding of the text. Instead, I think God sees the broken pieces in our heart that make us incapable of seeing ourselves clearly and the world clearly. He sees the stick in our eyes. So when we ask, we ask for God's wisdom and we seek God's righteousness and then we find, we find what satisfies truly the holes in our heart. See, we find that in all circumstances, when we seek, when we ask, when we find we find God in all ways. So Jesus builds on this theme of asking. And he starts to talk about this parenting example. Which one of you, if your sons asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? Jesus is being humorous once again. And maybe you can relate to this topic of pranking your kids. Because you see, in Jesus' day, there was a visual resemblance between the flat cakes of bread they would eat and the Palestinian stones. Be easy to swap them out and kind of make a joke out of it. And there was a resemblance between the eel-like snake or fish that they would eat and snakes. So it would be a funny way, you know, like with Halloween candy to pe play a prank on your kids or something like that. It's kind of how we treat Santa Claus. We think Santa Claus is so cute and cuddly and a fun thing. And then about the time we're about to put our little child on Santa's lap, we realize how creepy it is, right? And this is what it looked like for us in our parenting life. Yeah, poor Silas uh, was traumatized. This actually was the cover picture for Nine News during Christmas um, after that. Poor parenting. Jesus calls out our sinful nature plainly. Even though we are evil, we still know how to take care of our kids, right? And here's the kicker. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you who ask him? For a second week in a row, the hardest part of this sermon is the same. Can we trust God to provide for us? Even in our limited parenting, mortal parenting skills. We know how to pick out good gifts for our kids for their birthday, right? We know, oh, this is what our kid likes. This is what they're into. We can go pick out a gift at Walmart that they're really going to like. Walmart needs to provide me some money for this sermon, right? <laughs> and so we have to understand that that's not how God is. The temptation is to think that God is like your Aunt Thelma that shows up at Christmas every year and gives you a gift that's completely useless. That's not who God is. God is a good, good father who knows exactly not what we want, but what we need. The hardest part of the sermon for two weeks in a row is to trust that God is going to take care of us. That's why Jesus' words, directly from his mouth, the son's words that know this, tell us that how much more will God give us good gifts? Because if we are honest with our judgmentalism, the inner motive of our ju judgmentalism often comes from a mindset of fear. We see ourselves as thinking that we don't add up, that others have it better, that God is giving good gifts to others, but God's not giving good gifts to us. It is a mindset of scarcity versus a mindset of abundance. 
And if you always believe that you don't have or you're about to run out, then you will always be holding on in life. But if you have faith to see, to see how much God will continue to give you good gifts, then you are much more generous with yourself and with others throughout life. When you realize how gracious God has been to you, then you can do the eye surgery needed to be generous with the world around you. And so all of this leads to the golden rule. In everything, Jesus says, in everything, do to others what, what, um, do to others what you would have them do to you. So how do you have eye surgery? Well, it turns out the golden rule is how. If you don't want others to judge you or harshly, or, or, then you don't judge them so harshly. The different kind of generosity Jesus is talking about this week is a generosity in our judgment to other people. So what do all the words Jesus has to say have in common this week? If I can accept that God has been gracious towards me when he could have been judgmental, when I accept the notion that God is going to be, give me good gifts in life that I need, then it empowers me to be generous with other people in the same way God has been generous to me. It means I no longer have to pass harsh judgments on you. I can give you the benefit of the doubt. No longer do I have to find my security in being better than other people. I find my security as being a child of God. And this is the golden rule played out. I start to treat other people the way God treats me. God's generosity becomes my generosity. And here's what's crazy about it. It changes the world one heart at a time. Listen carefully to people's stories about how they came to faith. See, never ever in my life have I heard someone say, I came to faith because those Christians judged me so well. Never heard a testimony like that, right? I, I don't know of any conversions that stuck because they were like, man, they just shamed me into a place where I felt so terrible and then it just stuck. No, 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 no. Almost every conversion story you hear has the same pattern. Someone came to faith because when they didn't deserve it, when they were down on life, a Christian came and showed them mercy when the rest of the world judged them. When someone could have judged them, they showed them grace. When someone could have ostracized them and made them an outcast, instead, this person made them a friend. So dream with me for a second what this might look like. What would the world be like if we replaced our insecure, judgmental, anxious feelings in people Instead, with people who are so confident in God's generosity that they don't have to pass judgment. That sounds like a pretty good world to live in to me. So how does this work in practice? In theory, it sounds great. Well, what does this look like? Let me give you today a better way to look at people of Walmart. <clears throat> See, doing this, I think we can achieve something better than laser eye surgery. We can see the world better than 2020 vision. We can see the world with God's vision. It's the benefit of the doubt principle. See, when you see someone dressed ridiculous at Walmart, give them the benefit of the doubt. Think of the best case scenario. Make up excuses in your mind as to why they might be dressed like that. A guy wearing overalls with no shirt, he must be from Arkansas, right? <laughs> or maybe they can't afford nice clothes. Maybe all their clothes are in the washing machine. Maybe it's a single mother who didn't have time to dress herself up before she got the necessities for her children. Maybe these people weren't as blessed to grow up with the parents you and I were so blessed to grow up with. Because you see, we all have wounds. We all have brokenness. We all have things we could be judged for. But we all have the image of God 
placed inside of every one of us. Here's the hard truth. What we often see is often determined by what we're looking for. If we're looking for the worst in people, we will always find the worst in people. But if we're looking for the best in people, then we will often find the best in them. See, Jesus presents in the Sermon on the Mount, the Mount uh, generosity in a different kind of way. Jesus teaches us that God's generosity of judgment is our foundation for our generosity of judgment. It is a generosity of love. And so I've been reflecting this week on our experience with John. You know, I think God sent her to us, and she's been so much more of a blessing for us than we could have ever been a blessing to her. Ben hit on this last week when we took up the collection for her. When she walked in these doors, it would have been so easy to judge her, to stereotype her by worldly standards, to not greet her, to not welcome her, to not be hospitable to her, to not even talk to her, and in a sense, really quickly push her away because she didn't fit our category of what we would have deemed to be church. But you all didn't do that. You all loved her despite the differences. And you know what's so crazy about that? When we got to know her, when we got to love her, when we got to trust each other, we found out we had a whole lot more in common with her than the differences we had. And I think that's the lesson God taught us through Jal about judgmentalism. May the Lord continue to bless us with this spirit of generosity. Let's pray. God, today, may you do your hard work in us. This hard work of this eye surgery that we so desperately need. To see ourselves, to see others, most of all, to see the world the way you see it. So let us live with your generosity. Let us see through the power of your spirit the way you see people. And let us pass this generosity on to others. God, in fact, in faith, we ask that you would send us more people like John. More people that might look or seem different than us, but more people we could love and care for provide for that we could share in our blessings together of your love that you give us. God, allow, allow us to extend these stories, these conversion stories, these great acts of mercy and grace that we show to the world around us. That we may be the light on the hill, that we may be, do these good deeds to show people your goodness and your love and your mercy. So we thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who made all this possible. And we pray this in his name. In Jesus' name I prayed and the church said. Amen. Amen.